Welcome to the iPad Podcast. This is Lex at MaxFuture.com. Today is July 31st, 2011, and we're going to have, cover a lot of iPad news. And remember, this is a chit-chat-free podcast, and it's all iPad talk. So let's get to it. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about are the new MacBook Airs. And why do I want to talk about the new MacBook Airs on an iPad show? Well, I want to talk about the new MacBook Airs because the new MacBook Airs, which are fantastic, truly fantastic, small portable devices, also make me incredibly appreciate the iPad. And why do I incredibly appreciate the iPad? Well, I love my new brand new MacBook Air. It weighs a little over two pounds. It uh, is very powerful, very fast. It has an 11 inch screen and I can do, you know, I can do more professional things on it like ed- editing movies a little more, um, you know, better than I can with iMovie or Real Director on the iPad. But why does it make me appreciate the iPad? Well, it, one thing that really stands out is this. It makes me really appreciate the iPad's incredible battery life because this MacBook Air, which has about five hours battery life, you really can see the battery getting chewed down very quickly. So it just makes you appreciate the just incredible engineering that goes into the iPad too to make that battery last and last and last and last. So... I'm not going to return my MacBook Air. I find it very useful, particularly in recording this podcast when I want to be remote. I can do it with my iPad, but I can do more with the MacBook Air. I do think that one day the iPad will overlap with the MacBook Air, and maybe the two devices will converge together. In fact, looking at this MacBook Air, I can easily see how it will become one day a touch device and maybe even an iPad. I mean, I I spoke about this before. You know, the MacBook Air is so thin and compact and weighs just a little more than the iPad that I could see one day it would be easy. What if they could just take the screen on the MacBook Air and have it flip over and slide down so that the screen is facing up and covering the keyboards? What if it could go into like iPad mode? What if the operating system on a, on a MacBook Air could be dual booting so that you could go quickly to like an iPad format? And to some extent, it already is like that. Uh, if you're watching the video podcast here, I'll show you. For example, one of the interesting things is you can just do, um, you can just do pinch to zoom like that and see you have the launch bar which looks a lot like the apps that you see floating on the iPad so to a lot a large extent the MacBook Air and the new Lion operating system is converging with the iPad so I predict in a couple of years you will see Apple's line of computing devices converge I do think that eventually you'll 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 have like high-end iPads that have something like the line operating system on it and we're getting there more and more I mean iOS 5 is coming out and iOS 5 is going to make iPads for the first time completely independent they're no longer going to have to be tethered to a Mac or a Windows computer with iTunes to run so anyways so the MacBook Air which is a fantastic device and starts its cheapest price is higher than the iPad's highest price. The cheapest MacBook Air price is $999 and uh, the iPad I think its cheapest or most, more, most expensive price is like 800 something, 829 or 859 something like that. So anyways uh, again I truly think the iPad's glorious and I mean the other thing is just Although I, I use the MacBook Air for product, productive stuff, I actually use the iPad too more because I use it for gaming. I use it, it's more fun to surf the internet with the iPad too. Um, you can um, watch movies. I mean, you can just do a lot more fun things and buying apps is actually 
easier on the iPad too. I don't know, it just um, you know, because you, you have a whole screen as a touch surface. So, anyways, the the MacBook Air has me thinking about the iPad too. So let's go on to some other stories. Okay, so the first story that caught my eye is one from cultofmac.com, which really points out how there isn't really much competition to the iPad. And we know that. The iPad dominates. There really isn't a lot of choices for a full-fledged computing device to compete with the iPad. Sure, you can get a Kindle, but the Kindle's really just a reading device. It really is not something that you can run apps on and do a lot of stuff. Well, one thing that has gotten a lot of um, you know publicity and push since the beginning of the year as an a iPad competitor has been the Motorola Zoom. Well, Cult of Mac has a great little article that came out on July 28th called Apple sells more iPads every two weeks than Motorola sells Zooms in a year. And um, basically, Motorola had its uh, quarterly results or announcement and it reported that Motorola Zoom shipped 440,000 units last quarter. Now remember, that's shipping. That doesn't mean it sold it. Shipping can mean that you send it to your distributors. And, you know, that is more, you know, Apple, Apple sells that in two weeks. I mean, Apple sold 9.2 million iPads in the last business quarter. So if you prorate that, that's, um, that's uh, about, um, you know, how much, well, App, well, the article points out that Motorola expects to sell one to one and a half million Zooms by the end of the year, while Apple sells one and a half million iPads every two weeks. So it's pretty dominant if you think about it, because the Zoom is supposed to be the big competitor right now to the, to the iPad. Another article that caught my eye came from uh, electronista.com and it was entitled iPad owners happiest with their tablets now 79% of users. Now, I'm not too surprised by this article because the iPad totally dominates the tablet market. But according to to the, you know, this story which uh, relies on a study by IHS um it basically says that Apple users gave their tablets a, a much higher like rating than uh, Android tablet owners. It says iPad owners are the most likely to recommend their tablets than any other. It goes on to say out of 10, Apple users gave their tablets a typical 8.8 .8 rating, making them very likely to suggest an iPad. So. I mean, I'm, I'm just surprised that this is even a big story because obviously the iPad totally dominates. It says the bottom of the list included routinely cheap electronic makers, Kobe, um, but also Toshiba got a low rating. So this is just like a survey of people who use tablets uh, regarding the likelihood that they would recommend their tablet brand to friends and family members. So let's see. Z uh, Samsung had an 8.5 rating, which isn't that far behind Apple's, but Apple's was number one. The touchpad, uh, HP, was listed at nine, which is, uh, you know, out of uh, 11 manufacturers, that's pretty low. Toshiba was at the bottom at, at number 11. So, you know, it's an interesting survey, but obviously since the iPad dominates, and it's selling like hotcakes. There must be word of mouth, and people must be recommending it to their friends. Now, one thing I like to talk about in this podcast is how the iPad's doing at Enterprise. And it's an interesting story from the blog on Forbes.com. And it regards how the iPad is really in, invading uh, medicine. In particular, the, the article is entitled, Doctors Love the iPad, But What's the Prescription for Tablet Security? So according to this article, um, uh, there was a study done by a Manhattan research, a health marketing research firm, and it found that just one year after the iPad hit the market, 30% of U.S. physicians had, had adopted the, uh, the device, and an additional 28% planned to purchase an iPad within the next six months. That's pretty amazing if you think about it. 30% of a, a profession is getting it. But the gist of the article is that a lot of doctors are, are just buying it, you know, personally and then using it 
professionally and that this is causing a headache for IT chiefs at um, you know medical organizations because security obviously you have things like patient confidentiality and stuff like that and you know there there's the devices of the doctors not the hospitals and so you know this article is saying that you know th th that right now there's a little crisis going on because the IT people can't really figure out how to make sure that all these iPads are really secure now you know I think what Apple should do is Apple needs to I think Apple should come up with a um, uh, an enterprise iPad one that has special security features now the iPad does have a lot of security I think you can encrypt the iPad you've got the remote wipe uh, you have the ability to work with Microsoft's uh, um, you know uh, server enterprise server for email so there's a lot of stuff in there but uh, I think the problem is that corporate IT that's wor used to working with Microsoft products isn't used to iOS devices like iPads and so they need to get comfortable um, you know so this article is basically saying that there is this invasion going on where people are personally buying the iPad particularly doctors and bringing them into the work area and I, th I think what's going to happen eventually is that enterprise IT flooded with the personal use of iPads by the people who work in the enterprise are going to have to start you know implementing the iPad in the enterprise just because it's going to be there anyways anyways interesting article you should check it out I have a link on the blog to this article now I'm pretty sure that there's going to be a new iPhone 5 coming out in September uh, all the signs are there since uh, the iPhone wasn't updated in June like it usually is but I'm not so sure that there's going to be a new iPad in the fall there have been rumors of some sort of iPad 3 maybe even a very high-end iPad 3 but the iPad came out this past March April time period one year after the original iPad but there continue to be stories suggesting that the iPad 3 you know is get, is going to come out even sooner the latest story is from Mac Rumors which reports reprints something from Digitimes which is a Taiwanese based uh, uh, I guess tech newspaper but basically the story is that Apple is lining up iPad 3 suppliers in face of increasing number of competitors and what it says is that uh, Digitime reports that several Taiwan based companies have been pick picked to supply parts for the upcoming iPad 3. It says Taiwan based IC Design House, Novatech Microelectronics, Rich Tech Technology, it goes on. Uh, now, what's the significance of this? Well, Mac Rumors says that the significance of this uh, is that. Digitimes claims that Apple seems more willing to use integrated circuits from Taiwan based manufacturers quote as it is adjusting the cost structure for iPad tablets in order to, comp to compete with an array of tablet PCs to be launched by rivals in the second half of 2011 end quote well I'm not sure how significant that is obviously Apple's always looking for suppliers Apple's in a legal battle, uh, intellectual property battle with Samsung, which is a major supplier. So Apple's probably seeking to do diversify away from Samsung. And I don't know what how significant this is. You know, if Apple was going to come out with an iPad 3 in March, you'd you'd think that it would be lining up suppliers to you know to build it even now. These devices aren't made overnight. There's a lot of planning. So. I don't think this story necessarily means that an iPad 3 is coming out in the fall and I wouldn't hold off in getting the iPad 2 in the belief that there's going to be some sort of iPad 3 in the fall. Frankly, I'll be honest with you, I don't think the iPad 3 is coming out in the fall. I believe the iPad 3 is coming out in March, a year after the iPad 2. And why would that be? Well, because the iPad 2 is selling like hot hotcakes and there aren't really any competitors to the iPad right now there's no serious competitor so why would Apple rush to come out with uh, an upgrade when the current iPad 2 is you know finally meeting 
the supply is meeting demand, why suddenly throw you know a wrench into the system? And so, this is just a you know one of many stories that have been sort of speculating on when the iPad three is coming in, coming in, what kind of suppliers there are. But it, I don't think it really means anything. Okay, so you you probably think the iPad's pretty popular, but according to Cult of Mac, it's not only pretty popular in the United States. Apparently, the most the place that it's the most popular per capita is Hong Kong, and um, you know they found this information from something called MIC Gadget, uh, and basically uh, the st statistics are that 17% of Hong Kong's people own an iPad. Now that's pretty amazing. Uh, it says that this is six times the global average of 3%. Uh, according to the story, the market research was carried out by some, some company called TNS, which surveyed 34,000 people from 43 countries, 501 of which were in Hong Kong. Now that makes sense if you think about it, because Hong Kong is a pretty comp, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of population, but it's pretty c compact, and uh, it's pretty advanced. Uh, in China, in general, the iPad's very popular, but China and the mainland is a massive country with a lot of poor people, and um, generally, I think Hong Kong is pretty well off. So I'm not surprised by that. I mean, what would be more interesting is comparing how popular the iPad is in a large country like the United States with another large country like Russia or West, you know, France or England or even China. But, you know, it just shows you how popular the iPad is. Now, earlier we were reading about how doctors really love the iPad, but there's a story out that shows that the iPad may be becoming even more essential to medicine than just, uh, you know, something that doctors like to use. And the story is that uh, the iPad um, might be a, an important vehicle to, you know, modernizing medical records so that they're in electronic form. You know, that's the big push to make medicine more efficient. And so GigaOM has an interesting story, which is that um, th federal funding may help subsidize a free electronic medical app on the iPad. And the story says the iPad may, may help electronic medical records, EMR, sometimes also referred to as electronic health records or EHR, finally gain wide adoption thanks in part to a new program that will see the federal government dispersing grants to doctors who make use of, use of a free native EMR iPad app. And um, the article goes on to say Dr Dr. Chrono announced Thursday that doctors who use their EMR, EMR app to store and track patient data will receive up to $44,000 in incentives. The, it goes on to say the federal subsidies are now accessible to medical professionals because Dr. Crono has been certified for, quote, meaningful use, end quote, making it the only app of its kind to receive such certification so far. And it goes on to say meaningful use is a designation used by the government to describe EHR tech that meets a set of criteria that use that use can be accurately measured in quantifiable and quantifiable quantifiable terms. So this is kind of huge. Um, now the app is free, uh, but there are different packages that go up to seven hundred ninety nine dollars per month to use the app. So it's an electronic records app. So let's let's take a look at the app in the in the iTunes Store. Okay, so the app in question is called DR Chrono EHR in the uh, iTunes Store, and it's listed as a free app by drchrono.com Inc. And basically, it says, you know, it highlights the fact that it, that it's certified as a complete electronic health record in accordance with uh, ONC ATCB Stage One Meaningful Use Criteria and that you can qualify for $40,000 subsidy up to. So, you know, what can you do? Here are some of the features. It's got uh, H&P SOAP and customizable clinical notes, form building tools, real-time medical speech to text, paper me paperless medical billing, 
take iPad 2 camera photos and videos, take iPad 2 photo video patient documentation, e-prescribing drug allergy and condition notes, locking and e-signing of notes, view and print entire patient charts from the iPad. And let's see, what's new in the app or meaningful use certified real-time practice chat, log phone calls, allergy drug interaction. So, so this is interesting because I'm sure there are other electronic record apps, but this one seems to claim to be the first that's certified uh, in a way to get some sort of federal subsidies. So in the, you know, I'm not a doctor, uh, I have a relative who is, I can ask them what they think of this, but it's cool. You can see x-rays according to uh, the app and the screenshots. Uh, you can see, I guess, um, patient information, um, you know, medical forms, physical exams, assessment. Uh, so, you know, again, I think we're going to see apps de develop that are very useful in the enterprise and particularly useful in medicine. Um, you know, I just think it's easier for doctors to walk around with an iPad than just a you know a slate of paper this is this is much more useful okay so in addition to tablets uh, other casualties of the iPad and how successful it is as a gaming device uh, apparently uh, uh, you know another casualty is Nintendo now uh, Nintendo came out with the 3DS which is like this little portable device but according to cultofmac.com reporting on other news from other sources uh, Nintendo, you know, has bar been barely selling the 3DS, which uh, originally, uh, I guess, cost, well, I don't know, like $250 uh, or so. Uh, but the 3DS is now being slashed in price, uh, and it looks like uh, it's going down to $169. So... In, and according to this article, the Nintendo 3DS's main competition is the iPhone and iPad. And I think the thing is, for that price, um, why would you get the 3DS? You can get the iPod Touch for a couple of hundred bucks, which has zillions of games and can do many things. You can surf the internet, you can email. And so I think that the, the you know, the... The problem for Nintendo is that a dedicated gaming device is almost um, as vulnerable to the iPhone and iPad and iPod Touch as GPS devices, which are dedicated, or even cameras. I suspect point-and-shoot camera sales are down because the camera in the iPhone is so good, you know, wh I don't carry my second um, camera around. so. And the iPad is just a tremendous gaming uh, device. I mean, I, I play, I'm, I'm constantly finding games and playing them with my kids. And so I could see, you know, that the Nintendo 3DS is, um, you know, very vulnerable. And according to this article, um, you know, Nintendo's really suffering in terms of its sales and projected sales for the Nintendo t 3DS. Now, one of the things that I love about my iPad is its mobility. Uh, and um, the s I, I now have the iPad 2, which the version I have has 3G built into it from AT&T in addition to Wi-Fi. When I first got the iPad a year ago, the original one, I just got the Wi-Fi version. But I'm telling you, having a connection all the time really just makes the device super, super useful because... You know, it's just like your surfing device, your email device. You can do a lot of things for it. And in the past show, I've shown how you can use Line 2 to actually make it into a phone. Well, there's good news on the horizon, which is that um, we might be able to get cheaper, fast connections to the Internet and, and not be beholden to the uh, 3G connection from AT&T or Verizon. And um, apparently... The people behind the electronic standards for things like Wi-Fi have uh, a Wi-Fi next generation coming out, which is going to be called uh, IEEE 802.22. 
And so this next generation of Wi-Fi standard uh, is going to be using a lot of the uh, white space that analog TV you know, broadcast at before. But here's the wild thing. You're going to be able to transfer data at speeds up to 22 megabits per second to devices as far as 100 kilometers from the nearest transmitter. So a transmitter is going to be able to send super fast data 60 miles. So, I mean, this could really shake up shake up uh, cell phone companies because imagine, you know, in a city like New York, if you had some of these transistors around blasting high-speed Wi-Fi around, uh, why would you need 3G connectivity? You could even use that Wi-Fi internet connection for voice over IP. Um, so I don't know how quickly this is going to be implemented, um, but this is just fantastic news because, you know, the more I use the, the iPad and the iPhone, the more I'm thinking, why, why do we even have like AT&T and Verizon? Really, they're, they're in a way just dumb pipes. They're just delivering data. And why am I paying like one price for phone and one pri price for data? Because... I did this experiment on the iPad 2 where I'm paying $25 a month for 3G data and I was able to use the Line 2 app and have it be a phone. And so the point is the phone calls are just data and more and more they're voice over IP, VOIP data. And so we should just be paying one flat cheap fee for internet connectivity and that should be our communication device whether you want to call it a phone whether you want to call it an ipad whether you want to call it you know an ipod touch but anyways this breakthrough with the um the future of wi-fi is really exciting and god i hope they roll this out next year or the year after that because i can't wait for the you know the concept of um you know very powerful long-ranging wi-fi it's very cool now, to continue with the theme of futuristic iPads, there's another interesting story from, from Bloomberg, uh, which is entitled Solar Powered iPad Seen as MIT Advances Cells Printed on Paper. Now, this title is just probably trying to catch views by incorporating the iPad, but the concept is that we soon may have cheap, um, cheap ways to capture solar energy to power things like the iPad and the iPhone. And basically it says that engineers at Massachusetts Institute of Technology have created ultra-thin paper cells that gather enough juice to power an LCD clock and can be glued to a briefcase, stapled to a hat, or folded into a pocket. And the point is that these sort of paper um, solar cells are going to be very cheap and, it, and eventually they'll be efficient so that we're going to just have them everywhere. Now the question is, like, how would this help the iPad? Well, I guess you could make the cover of the iPad uh, a solar panel that would be sort of light and cheap and just gather energy. So you could imagine you just, like, leave your iPad sitting somewhere in the sun and it just helps, you know, prolong the life. So, but the article is generally about how uh, paper can be used as a solar, you know, solar capturing energy device. So, who knows what the future iPad could look like, but it may be that the iPad itself becomes a solar panel that can self-charge itself. That would be really cool. Okay, so if you're looking for shooting up, shoot em up games on the iPad, one of the more interesting, if not bizarre, free games that I've discovered uh, that's floating around out there I guess that came out on July 21st 2011 is, ca is called iGun Con and it's a free app and um, it's kind of wild I guess you can use it uh, together with like an iPhone or an iPod touch together with the uh, or uh, a Mac OS computer so you can c basically it says it's a basically like a toy shooting gun and you can touch on the screen uh, the controls to select handgun, machine gun, shotgun and grenade launcher so you gotta be careful about giving this to your kids 
because it's kind of um, you know violent. Uh, but the cool thing is in controller mode, you can connect this app as a wireless controller to another iOS device or a Mac OS computer, and um, and then I guess shoot uh, at targets. Um, so it basically says that the iGun Con can only be installed to devices equipped with both gyroscope and digital compass. So but basically it'll work on the iPhone 4 and iPod, iPad 2. And uh, you need the latest update of Time Crisis Second Strike or Time Crisis Second Strike HD running on a second Apple device such as an iOS or Mac OS in order to enjoy controller mode. Uh, so, you know, it seems kind of interesting. Um, the ratings are kind of mixed. Um, one person wrote, it does not work on the iPhone 4. I put it on the iPhone 4 and the buttons are way off and it does not let me connect to the game. Um, another person writes, what does this do? How does th this work? Uh, another person writes, it is flipped and it won't support the iPad. Another person writes with one star, uh, it just doesn't work at all. I can't click on anything on the screen. The only thing that works on the app is the play mode. So look, I'm not really recommending this, but it is kind of intriguing that you can use like one device to shoot on the other and it's free so let me test it out and maybe the next show I can uh, tell you if it works if it's worth um, downloading I mean again it's free but still we have to have our standards uh, even with free stuff so anyways it's an interesting concept um, and I'll check it out for you and report back next week Okay, so one thing that we've been seeing on the iPad are these dedicated uh, reading apps that really focus on a famous writer's, you know, particular work. You know, we saw that, I think, with T.S. Eliot. Uh, and there's a new app out by uh, Die Hard Studio that costs $2.99 called Telltale Heart HD. And it's basically, um, you know, a, a book app or a reading app that focuses on a famous story by Edgar Allan Poe. And it says that it's an interactive, fully painted, and fully voiced retelling of the classic Edgar Allan horror tale illustrated by Mutant League television series art director Dwayne Ferguson. Uh, it says it's fully voiced by Jane Hubert, co-star of the hit television series French, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Hunter Wolf. And it goes on to say it contains creepy media, mixed media paintings, interactive elements, bone chilling sound effects, and a 1930s style radio drama performance that will haunt your dreams. It goes on to say it's your choice to read each page without the voiceovers, and if you want to take your experience to the next level of horror, the skull on each page will let you hear the adrenaline-filled voiceover. And it goes on to say, this is the definitive version of horror master Edgar Allan Poe's legendary tale of suspense, dread, dread and terror. So it's interesting, because I think more and more creative types you know, are going to make apps for the iPad rather than just, you know, releasing a book. Because with an app, you can do all sorts of multimedia stuff. So this could be a way for artists to really, to really sort of make money in this age where things like ebooks and MP3s are just sort of devalued in price. You know, because there's so much, you know, so much free music that you can get. People don't pay a lot for an MP3, but, you know, people might pay a lot for some sort of multimedia dramatization of a, of a famous work. Here they're putting, like, I guess, real actors to read this stuff. So this is $2.99. Um, and um, you might want to check it out. It's not, in terms of these books that are, um, you know, sort of multimedia retelling of famous stories, this is on the cheaper side. Uh, it's not. It's not that expensive. So check it out. 
Okay, so one of the things that Apple's competitors have been touting is how their tablets can run Flash. You know, Flash is that um, technology from Adobe that a lot of websites have for video and interactive stuff. And Apple has taken a stance saying that the iPad and other iOS devices will not run Flash. And I, I have at least one friend who's got an iPad who's a little frustrated because he goes to some sites that run the video in Flash and he can't watch it. And there are some solutions to the Flash through other browsers, but they don't work particularly well. Well, there's a new solution uh, app called Skyfire Video Q. I have the link in the show notes for this podcast, and it costs $1.99. It's a universal app, so it works both on the iPhone and the iPad. And it basically says, I guess the the big you know the big selling point here is that you can you can watch flash videos while browsing with Safari on any iPad or iPhone. And basically, what you have to do is you install the Skyfire Video Q app, and then you simply click the mail link to this page on any browser to email the video URL to your Q and that opens the the app. So they're a little they're a little too cute by half when they say you can use Safari to browse uh flash videos because what you're doing is you you go to a site where you can't see the flash, then you you send the link and then that opens the app. And um so then it basically launches the app using the the mail to link. Um so you have to m- register your email address in the app to use it. And uh, you use the mail link to this page button in Safari to email a web page. Now, per- I'll tell you, like, this sounds great if you're really desperate for Flash, but I wouldn't get it because, frankly, I'm finding that more and more websites are dumping Flash or having a Flash alternative. And the alternative that everyone seems to be using is HTML5. On the other hand, if you go to a lot of, um, I guess, restaurant websites or, or wedding photographer we- websites, they all seem to use Flash or even some real estate pages. But this is a, this is a, um, a s- somewhat of a solution. To me, it's an imperfect solution because the idea of, you know, emailing uh, a, a Flash page and then launching it another app is not a very elegant way to, to. Um, you know, to see Flash on the iPad. Again, it's called Skyfire Video Q, and I have the show note uh, link to it. And but it's only a dollar ninety nine, so it's somewhat reasonable. Um, anyways, if you if you're really into Flash, check it out. Okay, so the deadline recently passed for apps conforming to Apple's subscription policy, which is that. If you're going to have sell um, subscriptions in your app or even sell stuff through your app like uh, books uh, or music, uh, Apple's going to take a 30% cut. And Apple's policy is that if you, uh, you know, you can have an app that, um, that doesn't sell it in the app, uh, but rather you, it sells it somewhere else and then you can get it in the app, but Apple won't allow you to have a link to a web store from the app, you know, to to buy it. And so a number of apps have been revised. And um, one that has been revised, according to CNET, is the Nook app. Nook is the Barnes & Noble reading app that competes with the iBook. And also the Kindle app recently also changed. So in the I'm not updating my Kindle app, and I, I suggest if you like the Kindle app, that you don't update it because the update removes the link when you're looking to buy a book that takes you to the website and the same for the Nook app and so um, you know you you can you can still get content on your Kindle app and your Nook app but the way to get content is just to go independently to the website for the Nook and for the Kindle buy your book and then it'll be dumped into your app you just you just can't browse the bookstore or go to a link from the app to the bookstore so um 
you know, there's this change is happening. Is it for the better? In some ways, it's kind of risky because in some ways, um, you know, Apple's risking maybe the Kindle sort of being dropped from the um, from the iPad. You know, maybe Amazon will just um, drop it altogether. Now, in my Apple podcast, I'm you know there was a story out that uh, Apple is rumored to be buying Barnes and Noble, and I think it it makes sense. Barnes and Noble costs about a billion dollars in market cap. And the reason I would get it is because I think the iPad has some vulnerability if for some reason Amazon just drops the Kindle app from the iPad. I think a lot of people, me included, like the Kindle app for its massive book selection, particularly compared to the iBook uh, book selection. And, um, you know, Barnes & Noble is a massive bookstore, and I, I assume the Nook has a book selection that competes with Amazon's. And Apple has $76 billion in the piggy bank. Apple could easily afford to buy Barnes & Noble. And if it did that, if Apple integrated the Nook and the Barnes & Noble uh, book buying experience into the iBook, then I don't think, you know, the Kindle being dropped from the iPad would be as much of a blow to Apple and to Apple's ability to attract customers for the iPad. So, you know, so we'll see what these rumors about Apple, you know, maybe acquiring Barnes and Noble come to. But anyways, you're left now with the situation where the only, uh, I guess the only ebook bookstore that you can buy books from within the app is the iBook store. And, um, you know, um, I wonder if that's going to result in more people buying books from iBook instead of the Nook app or the Kindle app. We'll have to see. Now, one very useful thing to do with your iPad is use it as a second screen for your Mac. And if you have a just an 11-inch MacBook Air, you could see why you would want to use the iPad as a second screen because you could really amplify the screen space. And there have been solutions, and one solution recently got updated so that it works well with Lion. And that is an app that costs $4.99 called iScreen. And um, basically, iScreen, you install on your iPad and you also install, I guess, some software on your Mac, Macintosh. And it works. And so in version 2.0.4, which just came out, it added uh, Lion support. It added PowerPC support, which is the the old type of processors the old computers used, and it added multi-touch scrolling uh, on the device, and it improved performance. And it has manual connect to your device by host name or IP. It added built-in uh, FAQ section, and a slow network indicator can be disabled. So you know. Uh, it's it's kind of a cool way to really uh, expand your computer. Its basic features include uh, multiple resolutions, uh, retina display support, multiple compression levels, built-in manual, and um, you know if you're really into you know using your iOS devices as sort of a uh, second way to look at stuff you know you should check it out now the reviews are kind of mixed in the earlier version not uh some fives some ones some twos so i don't think it's going to run perfectly um it's not the ideal solution i mean if you if you really wanted additional space maybe the better way to go is to um is to just buy a cheap monitor but let's say you travel a lot with your 11 inch MacBook Air and your iPad and you don't have another another monitor around in the crunch an app like this could be useful to give you additional you know space let's say you were editing in Final Cut Pro or iMovie and you just wanted more screen space so you know it's an interesting app you should check it out okay so one of the coolest free apps that I've come across recently is something called the Juneo 
augmented reality browser and it's free that's spelled j-u-n-a-i-o and this is really wild and basically it's a it's a browser uh, that replaces commercials in real life um, so it says Juneo is the most advanced augmented reality browser, a mobile companion and instant, store to, instant source of information about places, events, or bargain. What's on at the movies? Where is the nearest cash dispenser, taxi stand, or subway station? The best steak in town or hottest show? Finding your way inside exhibitions, getting added information on products, ads, or news articles, this and more at your fingertips. So you basically you hold up the um, you hold up the uh, the the iPad and you see the world in uh, with augmented reality, and um, you know it's it's very cool. It's free. It's probably worth checking out. Now, the next device is something I always thought about uh, would be great for the iPad, and it looks like somebody had the idea, and it looks like they executed it. Now, I, I play the piano, and the iPad is just a great you know device for the piano. Well, it's also a great way to learn the piano, and somebody has come up with a piano, like an electronic piano, where you plop in the iPad, and not only do you play along with the iPad, but the iPad screen you know shows you how to play so the device according to cult of mac is called piano apprentice and um it basically you know is it's like a piano that has a dock for the the ipad so um you know this this totally makes sense and uh it says here the um how much does it cost it cost um a hundred bucks uh it should go on sale in september and will cost a hundred bucks so it's not a huge keyboard um it's you know it's it's a midi keyboard and um and i guess you know it um you can use the piano apprentice controller to knock out a ditty in garage band so it'll work also with garage band um but it looks like It'll also teach you how to play. Um, you know, it's going to have some program that's going to work on the iPad and sort of teach you how to play the notes. So, you know, it's very cool. At the very least, it's an instrument and a way to control the keyboard in GarageBand. And if it's only a hundred bucks, you know, you might see these all over the subway in, in New York, people playing music with the iPad docked into it. It's it's definitely a, an interesting novelty gift, right? If you have a kid or you, you're going to give a present to someone, if it's only $100 and you know they have an iP iPad, it's a very kind of cool electronic keyboard that will interface with the iPad. So check it out. I have the uh, show note. I have the link in the show notes. Okay, another novelty device for the iPad is something I saw on CNET.com, and it's called the Binder Pad, and uh, it's a uh, a holder, an iPad holder, which clips into three ring binder. So basically, um, it's a simple idea. It's an iPad holder that fits into a three ring binder, so you can carry your tablet computer like the paper it it replaces so it cost twenty nine dollars and ninety nine cents and it basically is some sort of like slip or some sort of you know remember like when you were in school you had those like plastic um, I don't know plastic slips with three holes that you could put in a three uh, ring hold uh, binder so maybe this is good for kids in college and in high school they could take their iPad, they can st stick it in this binder, and then stick it in their, you know, thick notebook, their three-ringed binder, and then use it together with um, other stuff. So, um, you know, it's kind of an obvious concept, but it looks like somebody uh, somebody executed it. Uh, 
Okay, so what if you are a true Mac lover, and not only do you have an iPad, but you also have a, um, uh, a MacBook Pro? Well, for students in particular, there might be something uh, useful. Uh, Pad Gadget had an article about some back-to-school bags for kids, and they are called the Cocoon, Cocoon iPad bags, and there's two of them. And uh, the central thing about these are that they can hold an iPad. They look like knapsacks, and they have a sleeve um, that can hold an iPad 2 and also another sleeve that can hold a 13-inch MacBook, Mac, MacBook Pro. That's the, um, that's the, um, the, the pack called the sleeve. Then the other pack is called the Central Park Professional Backpack, and according to this article, it uh, it can hold a 17-inch notebook as well as your iPad. So they look a little bit like, um, well, the, the Central Park backpack looks like a backpack and the sleeve looks like a, sort of a, a black carrying case. So I have a link to the article, which will then take you to the products. The uh, Central Park Professional Backpack Cost seventy nine dollars and ninety nine cents, and the sleeve cost sixty nine dollars and ninety nine cents. And the sleeve has um, that sort of grid section where you can put all the little, you know, you can strap in all the little devices and mice and other little paraphernalia that you're carrying along with your iPad and MacBook Pro. So it looks pretty useful if you're um, in school. Um, this might be something you might want to get before the fall. Okay, so good news if you use, you know, the, the the Safari and iPad and you like to do a lot of uh Google searches cuz on uh Friday Google released an optimized search uh for the website for Google for Android and for iPad tablets. And so it's the first tablet optimized version of Google search and a new version according to tabletsplanet.com isn't something you'll need to download you just go to the website and so what they did is they simplified the layout of the search results page and increased the size of the page contents like text buttons and other touch targets to make it faster and easier to browse and interact with the search results so it's you know if you go to the search area it, it should look better than in the past and more optimized for the iPad as well as other tablets. So, you know, you know, Apple and Google O's don't get along, but Google does help Apple every now and then. Okay, so if you don't have a MacBook Air but have an iPad or iPad 2 and you want to have sort of the, you know, the feel of a MacBook Air, one way to do it is get one of these like cases that has a keyboard built in. And um, there are some newer cases out. Remember, this has been going on, this phenomenon, for, for the last year where people have made cases that have sort of keyboards with Bluetooth built in so that um, right there you have an external keyboard working with the iPad. Well, TUAW.com reviewed a new keyboard called the Crux 360. Uh, and it's it goes, I guess, for $149. And... Um, the reviewer at TUAW, Stephen Sande, he was pretty, you know, favorably impressed by it. He said, and this is the bottom line, he says, The Crux 360 is a very versatile and well-made keyboard case for the iPad 2. The solidity of the case is excellent, and the price is not out of line with other keyboard cases. Other than the odd placement of several keys on the keyboard, I was able to quickly start touch typing on it. As an iPad case, the Crux 360 also does a good job, although it doesn't work in portrait orientation. And he goes on to say, if you're considering using your iPad 2 as a laptop replacement, you might wait a few months. This same company, Crux Case, is coming out with a new case called the Crux Loaded that will feature a Bluetooth trackpad for actually controlling the iPad screen. I haven't seen that before, and uh, apparently that's going to cost $249. But my only hesitation with these are that it's going to add a lot of bulk to the iPad. I mean, one of the virtues of the iPad is that it's so, so light. Now, what I do 
I do occasionally use an external keyboard with the iPad. So what I have is I have an Apple wireless keyboard and I have, I keep one at work and I keep one at home. And the one at home actually also works with my iMac. Um, because I don't want to really carry along a lot of, um, a lot of weight. In fact, you know, the, I, the iPad 2, I have the smart cover, which is very, very light. And I'm hesitant to go to bigger cases that cover the front and back just because it's going to add more weight to the iPad 2. Because the real, like I said, the virtue of it is it's so light. Now, what I've what I've done for protection for the iPad 2, and I talked about this before, is I just went to Staples and got a bubble wrap envelope, just a standard size one that, you know, holds regular, you know, portrait size paper. And that's my, that's what I, that's my cocoon for the iPad 2. I put the iPad 2 with the smart case in that bubble wrap. It cost me only two bucks from Staples. And I just trimmed, you know, the flap and put some tape around the flap so you can just slide it in. But anyways, this is a digression. Um, you know, it seems like there's now a plethora of these key, uh, cases with keyboards in them. But really, the best keyboard is this uh, Apple wireless keyboard that you can get from Apple for like 69 bucks. And that's my suggestion for what you should use. Okay, so before we end tonight, I want to mention another free app I've been playing around with. It's called Screen Chomp, and um, it's a free app that came out on July 26th, and it's a version 1. And it's really sort of an educational app, and basically what it is, um, well, the, the big thing is it's sort of like a, it's like a whiteboard where you can sketch and um, draw and do stuff, but the cool thing is which I haven't seen in another app is that it screen records and then you can uh, share your video screen record of whatever you're writing up uh, on screenshop.com and is a web link that you can paste anywhere or post on Facebook with one click so basically you know it's it's sort of sold for like um, people in education it says Students can help each other with homework and work together on projects. Teachers tutor kids while away from school or record a few tips to send home with them. Mentors tutor youngsters from afar without buying desktop recording software. Kids share doodles and ideas with friends. And, um, you know, it's very cool in the sense that you can also, you know, th the whole thing that's cool is that you can share you can screen record your doodling. So in the screenshots, they have somebody doing like a math equa equation and they can sort of take it, you know, take them through the math equation. Now, I haven't tested whether or not you can record audio. I think you can. Um, oh yeah, you can give, so right, you can record your touch interactions and audio instructions. So it's a great way to sort of just, you know, do a tutorial, like maybe even like showing, um, you know, how to draw something or some equation. Um, in some ways, it's limiting, though, because it's more like a you can mark up a, a photo with it and draw on a photo. I doodled over a picture of myself. Um, but for educational purposes, it, wouldn't it be great if it could also screen record like you surfing on um, on um, on Safari and going to websites, you could sort of narrate your research and say, look, I've gone to Wikipedia. But basically, the only thing you can do here is work on a whiteboard and mark up photos. Now, it could be that Apple's limiting real screen recording. Uh, if you really want to do screen recording of all, your whole iPad, you have to jailbreak your iPad and get display recorder from the Cydia store. But this is the first screen recording in-app app that I've seen so far. So it's free. It's called Screen Chomp. So check it out. Okay, thanks for listening to the iPad podcast. This is Lex. This has been a chit-chat-free podcast dealing with the iPad. 
Any positive feedback in the iTunes store would be greatly appreciated. If you'd also like to have a Google Plus invite, just email me at maxfuture.com and I'll send you an invite. Google Plus is pretty cool and it works well with the iPad. So till next time, this is Lex from Max Future. Thanks for listening to the iPad Podcast.